Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Should President Donald Trump be impeached and removed from office? Is global warming predominantly caused by human activity, specifically humanly caused carbon emissions? Should government pass laws to restrict the ability of Americans to possess and use firearms? Should elective abortion be legal, assisted suicide, recreational cannabis? As you know, these are some of the big questions debated in our country today. In Jesus' day, people debated big questions too. Most of them probably circled around this whole matter of Roman domination and what the Jewish response should be. Should the Jews make friends with the Romans or should they resist them? Should the Jews pay taxes to Rome, or should they refuse? And many other questions of a political and practical nature were undoubtedly raised and debated on a daily basis in the land of Jesus and John and the disciples. And our Lord Jesus was surely well aware of all of these questions. But as we hear in Matthew 11, as Jesus began to speak to the crowds, the issue and the matter that he raised with them and that he brought up with them was not about any of these sorts of things. Jesus rather put his divine finger on the matter that was really of greatest importance for his people. The matter of John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? You remember the wilderness. The wilderness of Judea. It's where the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth had preached and baptized. As we heard last Sunday, the second Sunday in Advent. Matthew wrote, Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, to John. Masses of people, stirred by John's call, had hiked out to the desert to see and hear him. Even religious elites, suspicious and wary, had gone out. Matthew 3. Now Matthew chapter 11, today's reading, Jesus has many, many gathered around him, And many, if not all of those who were gathered around him, had had their encounter with John by the Jordan. And now Jesus wanted them to think back on that time. What had prompted them to go out? What or whom were they wanting to see? Was it, Jesus asked, a swaying reed? By which I think he means a shifty, cowardly, people-pleasing sort of person keen to make friends and to ingratiate himself with the powers that be? Well, the people knew John was not like that. Or else why would John have poked his finger in Herod's eye, calling out his highness's adultery, the crime which landed John in the slammer, as our bulletin cover depicts? So Jesus went on as he asked the people, Did you go out to the Jordan to see a man dressed in soft clothing? The people well remembered the rough appearance of this locust-eating, Elijah-like preacher. No, it was not to see a slick, well-dressed salesman of the prosperity gospel that the people had gone out into the wilderness. No. Then what, Jesus pressed them, did you go out to see? See, Jesus wanted the people to think again about John's significance. This one who had once called them to repentance and offered them baptism for the forgiveness of their sins. Jesus must have known very well that for all people, an experience that we've once had can kind of fade in our memory. We need to be reminded of it. He was doing that at this time. He asked the people what they went out to see. Was it a prophet that you went out to see? He answers his own question. Yes, I tell you. And then he takes it up a, a step. He says, and more than a prophet. John, Jesus declared to his hearers. He emphatically declared it to them. John was he of whom it is written, Behold, God's words, Behold, I send my messenger before your face 
who will prepare your way before you. More than a prophet, John was the divinely appointed way preparer for the Messiah. John the Baptist, Jesus declared, was the God-ordained forerunner of the end times deliverer, the Christ. John was that coming Elijah, whom the last prophet to record his words in the Old Testament, Malachi, had written about in his last chapter, in the last paragraph of the Old Testament scriptures, before the day of the coming of the Great One, I will send Elijah, Jesus said, John is he. See, if the people had forgotten about John and the ongoing relevance to their lives of his message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, then Jesus at this time by all means wanted them to call it to mind and to think about it. We should too. For a moment, set aside impeachment, environment, and the Second Amendment. And all the other political questions, they really are secondary. And focus, I urge you, on the one matter of chief importance. And this is how I'll phrase it. What did you come to church today to see? Did you come to see your friends? Now, on one hand, I hope we would all say yes. But if primarily that was the reason, then something's off base. Did you come because your parents made you? We've all been kids. That question resonates with all of us. Did you come because it's just what you do? Did you come out of a desire to look righteous in God's eyes or others' eyes? Or did you come to check a duty off of your list so that once completed, you can move on to what you really want to do? Or did you come, as today's Old Testament reading said, to see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God? Some come to church, it would seem, hoping and expecting the preacher to affirm every sinful whim and every selfish, willful way of their hearts. Did you come for those reasons? Or did you come with the desire that the God of Jacob, through his word, would teach you his ways so that you may walk in his paths? Some come to church with their hunger already sated and their thirst already slaked with all sorts of man-made things. Did you come that way today? Or did you come humbly seeking the bread of life which only God can give? And the cool refreshment of the gospel, God's word of good news, where he says, I forgive your sins. The question, always all important, why did you come to church today? Or what did you come to see, to hear? My friends, Advent, you know, is not about killing time before the big show of Christmas. Advent is about God having his way in our hearts so that Christmas can really be Christmas for us. Advent, like the whole Christian life, is about repentance. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Advent is about this truth. Jesus is the one who was to come. He is the Messiah in whom all God's good promises are fulfilled for us. Now, John the Baptist had his questions about Jesus, it turns out. We heard that at the start of today's gospel reading. John, from prison, sent word by his disciples and said to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Now, reading those kind of strange words, you have to admit, some interpreters of Scripture in the early church, it was many, many interpreters of Scripture, came to the conclusion that John wasn't asking that question for himself. He was asking it for the sake of his disciples, those who followed him, so that they could receive an encouraging word back from Jesus and have their uh, wobbly faith established and strengthened. 
John, people say, could not possibly have been wondering such things about Jesus. However, if you think about it, John had been taken aback by Jesus' ways once before. As Matthew tells us in the account of the ministry at the Jordan River. Remember? Then Jesus came to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Matthew writes, John would have prevented him. Saying, I need to be baptized by you and are you coming to me? And now, Matthew 11, from prison, John was experiencing not just the personal agony of being unjustly incarcerated, but John, through the reports that he heard, was observing, yes, reports about Jesus' mighty deeds, but a glaring absence in Jesus' ministry of any of the kind of clearing his threshing floor about which John had preached and prophesied at the Jordan, remember? One coming is greater than I, and he has his winnowing fork in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor. Put the wheat in his barn, but burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Metaphors or figures of speech for the righteous and the wicked. And John, well, he, he saw that the wicked were asserting themselves against God's kingdom quite well, thank you. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force? What gives with that? See, John, I think, was understandably confused. And we can be confused, really perplexed, too. When we look around today and see so much running off kilter in this world and very awry in this world over which Christ is Lord, False doctrine in Christ's church. Wickedness running wild in our communities. We see godlessness advancing and we see godliness everywhere under attack. And we say rightly, this doesn't look right in God's world. Indeed, the ongoing presence of evil in the world that God's Son has redeemed is, as one scholar put it, the strangest of all paradoxes in the history of the world. John faced it in his prison cell, and we Christians face it today. But to us, as to John, the words of Jesus come to restore to us the confidence of faith. To John's disciples, who had come to him with John's question, Jesus gave this answer. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. The Lord's own testimony about himself and his works. That's what he was talking about. That testimony which John's disciples brought back to that lonely and dark prison cell where their teacher was incarcerated. That testimony carried divine power to fortify John's faith. And the same words and the same testimony of Jesus carry divine power to fortify your faith, to establish your faith as well. See, the healing miracles of Jesus did more than just restore wholeness to broken and sin-wracked individuals. The healing miracles and deeds of Jesus fulfilled the scriptures of the Holy Spirit, such as today's Old Testament lesson from Isaiah 35, foretelling that the blind would see in that day, and the deaf would hear, and the lame would leap like a deer, and so forth. Those deeds of Jesus showed him to be the long-awaited Messiah and deliverer. And climactically, Jesus' own bodily resurrection from the dead gave the exclamation point to all his work. Right after he had died on the cross in full payment for the sins of the whole world, the entire human family of which we are members, right after Jesus at his cross had made complete atonement for the totality of our sin. Yes, when it comes to the deepest and true need of the world, when it comes to your and my deepest and true need, it is Jesus. 
Jesus is God's gracious answer. Jesus is the sacrifice to blot out all sins. Jesus is the one. So beloved believers, let nothing within you or around you deter or discourage you, offend or cause you to stumble from your Advent faith in Jesus. To you, through his word, God has revealed his great love and the truth that Jesus, his son, is given to be your savior, such that you are blessed forever in Jesus. This season of Advent reminds us to welcome the Holy Spirit's ongoing working of repentance within us, in our hearts, so that the flesh's lusts and unbelief do not grow stronger and stronger, but are daily put to death in us. John the Baptist's call to repentance has significance for the baptized as long as we live. And Advent also reminds us to be so grounded and established by God in his faithful word and his sure promises that the paradoxical presence of evil in our lives and outside us in the world and even in the church does not shake our Christian confidence in Jesus. Christ is Lord, and he will openly display his lordship on the last day. As you probably know, the Bible tells us that John never made it out of his prison cell alive. As for his execution at the hands of Herod, the Bible tells us a lot of interesting details, but not the mindset of John as he faced his death. It just doesn't talk about that. But we do know this from today's text, that Jesus, the Lord and Savior, conveyed to John through those messengers such a faith-strengthening and joy-inspiring message. And on this third Sunday in Advent, I like to think that John breathed his last beholding the beautiful glow of a pink candle. Rejoice! Jesus is the one. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.